Um, love to introduce to you guys to Ali Asimov. Ali is a, a dear friend of our foundations for a while and uh, uh, is practicing neurophysiologist, mainly up in North County, um, and is here to teach us. Just, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, yeah we can hear you. Okay, cool. Yeah, and Siri is going to give us a, a nice uh, lecture on intraoperative neuromonitoring, and I'm very much looking forward to this talk. Uh, thanks, Ali. As you know, we had our Scoliosis Research Society meeting um, last week, and uh, it was interesting to see that there was quite a bit of attention given to this very topic. So I think it's something that's on a lot of people's minds. And uh, again, look forward to hearing what you have to say this morning. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you very much, Ali Asimov here. And uh, yeah, mainly practice actually in San Diego. Uh, we're not going to North County anymore. Uh, so we, uh, yeah, we're helping all surgeons. I mean, uh, the group here, um, um, San Diego Spine Institute, uh, Ramin, Paul Kim, Chol Kim, and Kumshat. Uh, so, um, yeah, my topic uh, today is going to be a modern view of intraoperative neurophysiology. Um, so, as you guys know, neurophysiology is associated with um, electrophysiology, neuroanatomy, physiology, uh, mathematical neuroscience. So, uh, going further, neurophysiology has been a subject of research since, uh, uh, since 4000 BC. So the first evidence of the, um, uh, so um, as, as I told you before, neurophysiology has been the subject of research since uh, 4000 BC. And the first evidence was in uh, seven, 1700 BC as a surgical uh, papyrus was written um, and uh, become known as a Edwin Smith's papyrus. And, um, in 1862, um, this ancient document was critical to understanding how ancient Egyptians, uh, you know, studied uh, uh, neuroanatomy specifically and neuroanatomy. So it was like 48 cases recorded in that uh, document, ancient document, which is actually stored right now in, um, uh, uh, in New York. Uh, so that's the first evidence of the um, uh, studying. Uh, this is actually the, uh, the papyrus, it looks like. Uh, so surgical neurophysiology. Surgical neurophysiology is applied as a, a neurophysiology um, during the operation and um, a surgical neurophysiologist, monitorist, uh, functioning of the, the checking and the functioning of the nervous system, a patient's nervous system, which requires the electrophysiological study and part of the uh, patient's nervous system. Uh, this particular part of uh, big neurophysiology called intraoperative neuromonitoring. So in, in intraoperative neuromonitoring, we can divide uh, uh, that, uh, IOM and ba base, the, the basic part is evoke potential. Evoke potential can be divided to uh, visual evoke potential, auditory brain evoke, uh, auditory brain evoke potential, somatosensory and motors. So, and also we do uh, EEG, it's electroencephalography and uh, EMG as well, and triggered EMG. So um, evoke potential, um, for all types of evoke potential is preferably use the maximum stimulus intensity if there is no specific goals to reduce it. And uh, mainly we, uh, during the, the, the spine cases, the, our, our, our protocol is do somatosensory evoke potential for upper and lower extremities, EMGs uh, for muscles uh, being um, involved, and um, uh, trigger TMGs, EEGs sometimes to check an, an anesthesia, uh, depth of anesthesia, and uh, MEPs. So um, this uh, diagram represents the upper extremity, uh, median nerve, uh, SSCP. So uh, the measurement and signal sites for, for us is, uh, obviously 
decrease in amplitude and increase in latency. So usually the signal signs for us to report to the surgeons is 50% decrease in amplitude and 10% decrease in, I mean, uh, increase in latency for interpeak intervals. Um, this is the uh, slide represents the lower extremity, some of the sensory walk potentials with all pigs and stuff, the tibial nerve. Um, motor walk potential. Motor walk potential is actually electrical um, uh, potentials of muscles and spinal cord that cause uh, a response to irritation of motor cortex or motor pathway to the central nervous system. So, um, that gives us uh, basically coverage for uh, anterior portion of the spinal cord, whereas uh, SCCP give us uh, vast information for a dorsal column. So uh, motor evoke potential is kind of like uh, descending signals with stimulating motor cortex from the scalp and uh, gathering a response from uh, the, the stimulus travels through uh, alpha motor neurons. And uh, we should get the response uh, from um, proximal muscle groups. The more proximal we're getting response, it's more accurate uh, our assessment should be and our reporting to the surgeon. And some of the cases we might lose uh, um, uh, motor response, uh, specifically scoliosis cases with big deformities uh, where uh, once surgeons, uh, you know, trying to straighten up the spinal cord, it might change the uh, usual integrity of the um, uh, passage for the signal uh, from anterior portion of the column. So uh, this um, <clears throat> next slide represents the motor cortex and homunculus, where uh, the, uh, the, the actually the pathway of the um, motor neuron. So uh, as I mentioned, we're stimulating centrally is uh, descending signal and getting uh, should get the response peripherally from peripheral muscles. And um, golden standard is uh, that once we stimulate the motor cortex, we should get response from hands and from belly. So uh, electromyography, EMG, as I mentioned, is another uh, modality uh, which was used in operating room and um, in surgical cases with uh, 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 electromyography basically give us uh, uh, information regarding nerve irritation when we're testing the pedicle screw fixation and uh, nerve identification when we stimulate the nerve uh, after decompression and reflex testing. So um, electromyography in intraoperative neuromonitoring uh, vastly used in uh, neuro cases where we um, monitoring the cranial nerves. So, uh, and it's, it gives a lot of information for neurosurgeons uh, while they uh, operating and um, uh, performing a case. So uh, this is the, the cranial nerves that representation of the, uh, for, for monitoring cranial nerves, basically. This is the placement for, uh, uh, for those cases, uh, this is the, another placement for uh, and uh, exactly representation of the each nerve, uh, what we're trying to monitor and gathering information. Uh, electromyography and, and um, orthopedic cases, we usually um, um, going by levels and uh, if we know the levels uh, represents the muscles, that muscles needs to be monitored basically. And here, this is the slide, give us the muscle representation and uh, uh, what we monitor for um, orthopedic cases, specifically for ACDFs and thoracolumbar fixation, fusion, 
and uh, lumbar decompressions and etc. So, the, in those cases, we are mostly um, uh, watching and monitoring uh, free run EMG. It's called free run EMG, and also we watching and triggered uh, EMG for. Uh, compound muscle action potential specifically when um, instrumentation involved. So uh, the, the, the pedicle screw testing, that uh, refers to instrumentation involved. When pedicle screw testing, we should see the compound muscle action potential uh, response every time when surgeon touches the uh, pedicle screw and we gradually stimulating that uh, screw to give a, a feedback to the surgeon for, uh, screw, for screw placement, for correct screw placement. So in 40% 40, uh, 40 of the screw placements, uh, uh, it was misplaced without being tested, so to speak. Only 20% is obvious to the surgeon. Another 20% uh, 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 yeah, only 20% for out of 40% misplaced screws is obvious to the surgeon. That's why I think, uh, you know, the neurophysiology and monitoring and testing the pedicle screw is uh, pretty important um, and it, sh it should be done in every single uh, screw placement. I know some of the surgeons, they uh, rely on um, uh, brain lab and uh, they're not testing the screws, but uh, this, is the, this is the statistics. So 40% of screws has been misplaced. So uh, that's why- 40%? Yeah, yeah, 40% 40, 40 been misplaced. So- uh, Those are just handy screws. Yeah. <laughs> well, so and, and only twenty percent is obvious to the surgeon. So you know, specifically when we when when you guys doing like big uh, deformity cases, and uh, I think it's it's important to test the screws because uh, some of the some of the spine spine surgeons, orthopedic guys, they they don't test the screws. So, and we're working with those guys like closely. Um, next important subject in uh, neurophysiology, and I think it's uh, they playing a major role in operating room is anesthesia. Uh, basically, neurophysiologists, they're the part of the um, operating uh, scene, being part of the operating scene uh, along with the surgeon and anesthesiologist. So, anesthesia requirements is, is supposed to be a balanced anesthesia, you know, for uh, all uh, spine cases, preferably TIVA these days, uh, the little intravenous anesthesia for all cases, if not, uh, you know, balanced anesthesia, we call it nitrous oxide, uh, muscle relaxant and some uh, opioid, opioids uh, to, to produce minimal changes because uh, short latency, um, short latency evoke potential is less effective by anesthesia and uh, uh, whereas, um, long latency potential is somatosensory evoke potential and motor evoke potential, which is like golden standard, is affected to anesthesia most of the times. And that's important for anesthesiologists to uh, communicate with us and basically uh, trying to give us the anesthesia regimen, whatever is required to, for us to, to uh, collect the good, valuable uh, data. Uh, based on that, surgeon can, you know, do um, these manipulations and uh, etc. So um, there is no anesthesiologist, right, on on, uh, on meeting right now. Do we have any? No. 
<laughs> but feel free to express yourself. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's, it, it, you know, because sometimes anesthesiologists, they, they go like, no, I have my own standards and this is it. You know, you have to play with it. I'm not going to change it. Absolutely. Absolutely. We deal with them all the time. Yeah, so that's why it's, I thought there's going to be some anesthesiologists too, so they, they should understand this. You know, we, we're not asking this because just because we need that or uh, give them like more work or something. We have to get her adequate, you know, a response and, and provide you guys with adequate uh, feedback regarding the patient, yeah. you know, neurological status and et cetera. Specifically, when, uh, when um, the, the big, you know, deformity or corrections involve, it changes like game, like dramatically sometimes, you know, like last week we had a case with, uh, um, not two weeks ago, sorry. We had a case with um, uh, K-Raz a day, which it, it, it was a cervical case, pretty simple simple case nice and easy i think it was like single level and we had like absolutely great response and anesthesiologist trying to help us uh by infusing ketamine which is good good enhancer but instead of like 10 milligram of uh, ketamine he inf infused like 100 and patient uh woke up without any movement you know, and that was pretty scary. Wow. So, yeah, th yeah so th that's why, you know, the role of anesthesiologists is pretty, pretty important and they should understand what we, wh why we're asking uh, and why we're requiring this, you know, the certain anesthesia regimen. And they need to comply with us somehow. So, and um, that's why it's like in general principle of neurophysiological monitoring in operating room, in my perspective, my opinion, I think it's, uh, it should be as a, as a um, team kind of, a, you know, assessment where surgeon can ask anesthesiologist and uh, to, 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 you know, provide adequate anesthesia in order for us neurophysiologists to collect, you know, valuable uh, data and provide valuable true feedback of the neurological status of the patient to prevent, you know, further uh, uh, prevent uh, good outcome too after the case. Like example that I mentioned couple of weeks ago, you know, throughout the case, we have no, no problem, all response were perfectly fine, EMG, SSCP, motors throughout the case, and boom, when patient wake up, he couldn't move, okay, then the, you know, the uh, order stat, MRI, and all that stuff, and then we find out that anesthesia was like giving, you know, 100 cc of ketamine. So this is this is the pretty much the conclusion of the talk because you know when I called my and asked what kind of talk you guys uh, you know want to hear she said like introductory you know for uh, fellows and then further uh, more we're gonna prepare more talks for specific you know case uh, maybe case reviews or interesting cases where. Uh, most of the time, you know, during the um, cases, we're not seeing huge improvements. That's the, that's the main goal and that's the main, I think that should be a main understanding for uh, operating physicians because, uh, of course, everybody wants to, wants to hear like positive uh, feedback from neurophysiologists and most of the guys asking, do I have any improvements on my patient or did that specific signal improved or uh, yes, it wasn't, it, it, I, I, don't get me wrong. There is a cases where you see like immediate improvement after the compression or immediate improvement after correction or immediate improvement if it's like acute, uh, you know, stenosis, uh, etc. 
but most most of the time we're not seeing that and and it's hard to kind of like um explain to the surgeon okay because this was a chronic issue ongoing issue for a long time and patient being in pain for like several years etc and we we cannot do this or we cannot enhance our signals just to show you or yeah after your decompression it was like huge improvement it's going to be improvement you know it's going to take time so um I think this is uh, th this is um, kind of um, uh, communication. I think th the communication is the key in operating room, and we should uh, we should communicate more, and uh, we should I think talk more about the positive outcome. Yeah, of course, ultimate goal for everybody is positive outcome for the patient. But uh, so, sometimes it happens, sometimes it's not. So, uh, the, but definitely neuromonitoring is the valuable, uh, valuable tool in, in surgical evac. Can I, can I ask Thanks, you Ollie. Comment? Really appreciate it. Yeah, go for it. Go for Thanks, it. All, thanks, Ollie. For somebody that's not local, can you just comment on the importance of audiology training or, or if you think it's important or not? Or Well, audiology training. So uh, back to that subject, you know, my background is I'm MD and I was trained in neurophysiology at UC Davis and uh, UCSF, then mm -hmm. my clinic and UNLV. And, uh, you know, audiology is only... Uh, the audiologists doing this, uh, I would say only in San Diego. So yeah. rest, rest of the country, uh, non-audiologists uh, doing uh, neuromonitoring. So I, I think this is because in San Diego, neuromonitoring start with Dr. Hicks. She's, she was audiologist and Robin Wong. Uh, he was an audiologist and they were trying to protect, I think, uh, their, uh, it's a historical president, not a clinical, clinically important phenomenon. Yeah, so uh, I think you know I've been I've been in conference in Austria. I've been in conference in Germany over there. Neurologists, uh, they're neurophysiologists. They specifically train for to become a surgical neurophysiologist. I think it's uh, it's a neurology. It's supposed to be a branch of neurology, not not audiology. So audiology, yeah, audiology knowledge is used um, for uh, neuro cases. You know where we can do auditory brainstem, uh, evoke potential. Uh, for those cases, yeah, audiology is is, is we can we can it can be used, but. Most of the cases, I would say like 90% of the cases where neuromonitoring involved, ideologists are, well, it's, that's my opinion. Don't get me wrong, they're all good uh, neurophysiologists, retrained, and I tell you more, because of the, I have to, you know, play a fair game in San Diego market, my neurophysiologists, all audiologists too. Just because of the, you know, San Diego market, they don't, they not allowed any other being credentialed in hospitals if you're not licensed audiologists. That have been set stone here in San Diego. Good to know. Hey, Ali, thanks for the talk. Can you comment on monitoring dermatomes and is this a useful modality? Well, uh, dermatomes, uh, it's again, it, it was created by Robin Wong, uh, dermatomal uh, monitoring. My opinion, it's less informative, uh, whereas traditional EMG, but uh, sometimes it's helpful, it, 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 it helpful tool, but but I think we should we should stick with the gold standard by set by American Society of Neurophysiological Monitoring, 
which uh, they mentioned dermatomes, but not as a golden standard. I, 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 my opinion, we should, we should stick with the golden standard, whereas uh, as far as the main modalities for neuromonitoring are supposed to be somatosensory evoke potential, uh, electromyography, trigger TMG for pedicle screw stimulation, uh, EEGs, and <clears throat> excuse me, and um, auditory brain. So, so you don't make monitoring dermatomes a standard part of your cases? Is that no. something you do for no. special cases, or do you do it for all cases? No. Well, we're not, we're not, we're not, we're not using dermatomes. No, no. Yeah, it's Got it's it. nice, nice presentation, uh, etc. But dermatomes not reliable, uh, not reliable modality. My opinion, my opinion. Uh, you know, everybody has their own opinion. Uh, Whoever create dermatomes, uh, they think it's it's valuable, but uh, you know we stick with the golden standards, anyways. So it's a, it's same thing applies to H reflexes. You know some of the groups here, specifically Gale's group, they strong believer believer on Hoffman's reflex is called, is also known as a H reflex, which is uh, we had we we were using H reflexes a lot. Well. I, when I was when I was uh, providing service at university with Dr. Yupo Lee, and we had a big scoliosis cases where um, I was um, told back then I was part of the Gales group and I was told you know TCMEP is not really informative. You have to you have to uh, do H reflex. I go like okay fine I'm, I'll do H reflex. H reflex is kind of a mixture of uh, sensory and motor uh, uh, response. So it's um, descending as a sensory and ascending as a motor. Uh, so basically it's peripheral um, stimulation of let's say um, uh, median nerve and getting response off of the off of your hand uh, from uh, thinner or hyper thinner it's not it's not central so the, the 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 physiology of the of this modality specifically for h reflex that this is applies for dermatomes too it's not it's you're not checking from all the way top to all the way bottom. So that, if if you know what I'm saying, that's why we we stick with uh, we try to stick with the golden standards. Where SCP, EMG, TCMEP, trigger EMG, EEG sometimes. Thank you for the info and thanks for the talk. Hi. Sure. I have a, it's Rob Ames, one of the spine fellows. I just have a quick question. Uh -huh. um, there's thresholds obviously for motors and, and sensory um, modalities, but for, for free running EMGs, is there objective um, sort of anything objective that we can use in the OR for interpreting the, you know, information coming from free running EMG? So for free running EMG, free running EMG, basically you have to focus on, on two, um, two kind of um, uh, response. Free run EMG is um, affected by anesthesia only by muscle relaxants, that's it. Uh, and then free run EMG, in order to um, uh, adequate assess the free run EMG, patient needs to be, need, we have to have four twitches out of four and train of four. So um, that's why free run EMG, you can basically um, um, assess that it's, it's either burst, you can see the burst, or uh, you can see a neurotonic discharge. Uh, neurotonic discharge is basically the irritation to, to, um, to the nerve, which uh, comes and goes. Uh, depends on surgical events, whereas uh, burst it can be uh, it can lead to potential nerve damage. If you're seeing bursts for more than like three minutes, I would be considered, and your neurophysiologist is supposed to give like, for example, we monitoring cases for Dr. Kim Chol Kim, 
and he, every single case he wants to hear burst spike train of uh, EMG irritation. Also, he wants to know the size, size, small, medium, large, and side of the uh, of the um, irritation, left or right. So, uh, in uh, in my opinion, it's overkill, yes, but at the same time, he is getting adequate feedback constantly while he is in canal, while he is in uh, decompression mode while he is irritating the nerve. And he, he wants to hear like feedback from the surgeon, I mean, from the neurophysiologist, which is, yeah, it's overkill, yeah, in operating room, but at the same time, the role of neurophysiologist is, is kind of like, yeah, I'm, I'm present there because he wants to hear what's going on deep in the tissue. I hope I, I, awesome. hope, I, yeah. I, hope, no. I, I hope I answered that question. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. All right, guys. Ollie, thank you so much for taking time to do this this morning. Um, uh, yeah. Really, really appreciate it. And um, sorry to got yeah, I got your location wrong. I think I have it in my brain. I think I made that mistake one other time. <laughs> so, anyways, I apologize. Uh, but we do appreciate you being here and uh, giving us sort of that introductory talk and. And uh, uh, certainly, um, uh, it was, uh, it's always great to learn from you. So thanks so much. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, guys.